Hello, and welcome to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about gunfighting with God at the center, where he belongs, and real world, first-hand experience. Tried a new format recently, putting the bio at the end, but I didn't really get any feedback one way or the other, so I'll put it back in, in the beginning. Before I start the bio, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a review. If you like this podcast, if you want more, your one-stop shop for more is goodshepherdtraining.com, goodshepherdtraining.com. Today's episode is going to be a fun one on truck guns. First part of the episode is going to kind of be nostalgia and traveling guns of days of yore. And in about the 16 minute mark, we're going to get into modern truck guns. If that's all you want. You can skip ahead to that. And if you want to skip the bio, skip around three minutes, 45 seconds from where it starts. With that, we'll roll into the bio and then the episode. Hope you enjoy. First and foremost, I am a servant of God, preacher, a fisher of men. God is number one in my life and everything that I do in this podcast is no different. And I don't apologize for that. A little bit about me in the background. I grew up, I guess what you would consider a heathen. Didn't grow up a Christian. But I grew up in the southeastern United States, what most would consider very poor. Hunting and fishing and shooting. Joined the Marine Corps at 17, did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. After my combat tours in Iraq, I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in law enforcement for several years in LAPD. I worked patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. Where by God's grace, he got me through some nasty places in this world of war zones. And some of the nastiest streets in the country. Not because I am better, because God chose that mercy on me and had a purpose for me. And I'm thankful for that. After my time in law enforcement, I was a private contractor for a federal government, for a three-letter government agency. I won't specify doing private contracting work. I'm very much involved in guns and gunfighting. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. I should say my primary MOS is in both branches of the military or infantry as of one sort or another. Specialized infantry in the Marine Corps and an MOS that no longer exists. I started competition shooting even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I won my first gold medal even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I've been blessed by God with the talents he's given me to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I've won most of my competitions in rifle and pistol, but I've also competed in archery and shotgun and even muzzleloader, uh, knife throwing, hatchet throwing. I've competed in all that. I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide. Like I said, I grew up hunting and, and fishing and shooting. I've done it to put meat on the table because I like to put food on the table with the talents God's given me. I don't apologize for that. I've done it as a professional hunter and guide. I've slain all manner of beast. And guided for all manner of beast. Bear and wolf and elk and deer. Mule deer, white-tailed deer. I've slain ram. And fallow deer and countless animals. And I don't apologize for that either. FBI certified firearms instructor, NRA, and a bunch of other three-letter government agency certifications. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Psalm 144. I've been blessed to be the commander of a tactical team, an SRT special response team in a large metropolitan area, where our primary job was to stop active shooters. But again, first and foremost, I'm a servant of God, called by God to share the good news, preacher. A fisher of men. With that, we will roll into the day's topic. And that topic, I think, is going to be a fun one today. And that's going to be truck guns. Now, truck guns is kind of a common term if you're in the gun world, the gun culture. 
But, I mean, it could be the trunk of a Honda Civic or really the front of a quad, whatever that is. But truck guns, guns that you carry on you to be ready, they give you a little bit more firepower than you normally would have in, let's say, your EDC handgun. So let's just assume that all of us men stand ready, a well-regulated militia, and we carry a handgun day-to-day, -day, CCW. Let's assume that from the start. And let's move on to there to truck guns. Something that's going to give us a better rate of fire, more firepower, the ability to stop whatever common threats we may encounter quickly and efficiently. Now, I was thinking about this, and I think we'll start off with kind of the origin, the old school, what you would think about as the old school truck guns. And I think the original truck gun kind of predates trucks, kind of predates the automobile. I think kind of the quintessential classic truck gun is the American lever action carbine, let's say a Winchester 94, or the old school Marlin equivalent. You know, you think about the dusty old cowboy on a cattle drive, or after the cattle drives were over, you know, riding the fences, keeping the cows in. He likely had a pistol on him. And then, you know, in the scabbard on his horse, he likely had a lever action rifle, Winchester 94 or the like. And the other real common one, we even still call it, call them coach guns. The double action, you know, shorter barrel side by side shotguns. You think about, you know, the old Wells Fargo bank coaches. You know, they're called a coach gun because they were on a stagecoach. That's what they were used for. Warding off bandits and robbers and nefarious people. And I'd say they've really kind of stood the test of time. You know, Winchester 94 behind the front seat of, of an old pickup truck with a bench seat would be a fine choice. You know, having one of those old lever actions to pull out to dispatch a coyote or put down an injured cow or any number of things. You know, that's still not an uncommon thing out west out here. I would argue that the shotgun's a little bit antiquated. I do have my grandfather's old side-by-side. -side. While it's a fine gun to hunt with, and it's a fine piece of machinery, it doesn't really give you that reasonable rate of fire that you might want, and they're far generally more expensive than a pump shotgun, and a lot of times more than a semi-auto. So I'd, I'd argue that those are a little bit antiquated, but still, you know, much more firepower than a handgun. You know, a, a big old double barrel side by side with double all buck is still a formidable weapon. It was a formidable weapon 150 years ago, and it's a formidable weapon now. But you know, a lever action 30 30 or 45 70 or something like that is a reasonable rate of fire, an effective cartridge. It's light, it's handy. And again, a big step up in firepower. And the ability to engage multiple targets at different ranges at greater distances than you're probably going to get with your handgun. So I'd say that's kind of the genesis unless we go way back to the old like blunderbuss. But as far as modern, you know, traveling guns go, modern truck guns, I would say that's kind of the genesis and the origin. And again, that, they're still not a bad choice. Now, if you bump it up a couple of decades, looking in the 19, let's call it the 1950s to the 1980s, you know, what were you likely to find? You know, when I was growing up, it still was pretty common to have a gun rack in the back of somebody's truck. That was still, you know, a common thing. And in those decades, what you were likely to find back there was a pump or semi-auto shotgun and some kind of rifle. Usually a bolt-action rifle. A lot of times in that era, it was one of the old military conversions, whether it was a Mauser or an Enfield. Or kind of the quintessential one for me growing up was the SKS, which is still a fine weapon and would still be a fine truck gun. But those kind of three, you know, starting in, well, even before, but I would say in the 1950s and on to the 1980s, a pump shotgun was kind of something every country boy and most American men were familiar with. And probably, if they had a truck gun, it was likely in their arsenal. 
you know, a 20 gauge, a 16 gauge, which is kind of fallen by the wayside or still the most common today, a 12 gauge. You know, an old Ford or Chevy truck rolling down a dirt road with a pump action shotgun in the back kind of just brings up images of nostalgia and metal Coca-Cola signs and Norman Rockwell paintings. And again, I'd say that's the test of time. You know, that is one of my go-to truck guns. It mine's a semi-auto, but a good repeatable shotgun. Let's move on to the probably the next most common one you see would be a bolt action rifle. Likely in 30 out six by the 50s and 60s, 308 was becoming very common. 243. So a bolt action rifle and one of those quintessential oh I forgot 270. How could I forget that? One of the quintessential iconic American rounds in a bolt action rifle, maybe iron sights, maybe a you know fixed four weaver or some kind of scope on it. But a good center fire bolt action rifle. There was a pretty common truck guns. In fact, in my professional hunting and guiding days, the most common thing a guy would have would be a 243 bolt action of some kind. But you know, like I talked about, an old military conversion 30 out 6 or an American made, you know, 700 Winchester Model 70, something like that. And then getting up into the 80s. Now, yes, I know that Armalite came out with the AR-15 in the 1950s. I realize that. I know that it was started out as a civilian gun and adopted by the military. I understand that. But I don't think you were going to commonly come across an AR-15 in the back of somebody's truck. I, that, I don't remember ever seeing that growing up. And I, I'm not saying that nobody did it, but I'm saying it wasn't a common truck gun. Really, the, the most common truck gun I remember in that guise, again, is the SKS. Growing up, you could get those for, you know, $79, $100 all day long. The SKS, they were durable, they were reliable, and they were cheap. That was probably the most common rifle for hunting I remember growing up. Lots of people had them because, again, they were cheap, they were reliable, and they worked. And they were 79 bucks. You know, if you threw it in the bottom of a canoe or threw it in the back of your truck, it, you weren't worried about beating it up. It was a working man's gun. And I would argue it's still a fantastic choice for a truck gun. It's got a good intermediate caliber. It's good for medium to large game. It's good for defense. It was designed as a defensive rifle. I would argue... Especially in states where you can't have a detachable magazine or a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds. It's still probably on the top of the list. So the SKS was likely one of the first common semi-autos you would find as a truck gun. And I remember growing up, and I was a kid born in the early 80s. Like the cool, Gucci, tactical before tactical was really a word. Like the cool guy, soldier of fortune gun. That you aspired to have as a truck gun in the back of your truck was a Mini 14. The Mini 14 Ranch Rifle. You know, I know that today the AR really has become, you know, America's rifle. And it's, from what I hear all the time, the most common rifle in America. But you don't have to go back very far. And that wasn't the case. Yeah, the ARs have been around since the 50s, but they weren't super common on the civilian side for a long time. you got to remember the assault weapons ban. That hasn't been sunsetted that long, but when I was growing up, nationwide, there was a ban on high-capacity magazines, a ban on like most modern ARs, and there was only one or two companies that made them. There was Colt, and there was Bushmaster. For a long time, there may have been a few oddball ones like Olympic Arms. There was nowhere near what there is today on the AR market. If you get an assault weapons ban or pre-ban AR with you know, no flash hider and a 10-round mag or any of the other ridiculous things that they made you do to them, at that point, you got to argue, you know, is it really an AR-15 anymore? But the Ruger Ranch Rifle was kind of like the working man's AR-15, the common man's tactical rifle. It was super prevalent in, you know, the 80s and the 90s. You know, the Ruger Mini-14 came out in the 70s. I think by the 80s, it was kind of in full swing. 
And I'm a big fan of the Mini 14. I really like them. I use them as a police officer. I think in a lot of ways they're better than an AR-15. I know, I know, crazy. But I've trained with both. I've shot both. And to be fair, I don't own a Mini 14 or a Mini 30. I really like them. But I have so much training and experience in the military and in law enforcement with the AR. Even though I may like an AK or a Mini 14, the amount of training I have in an AR really sways me to just use and run those. You know, having decades and decades of experience running that pattern of rifle. So again, I'd say that that's still a fine rifle and a fine choice. And there's all kinds of weird laws in, in states that try and restrict your right to keep and bear arms to infringe it. In a lot of those states, you can have a Mini-14 for whatever reason, but you can't have a regular AR. You have to have one of those, you know, semi-neutered AR-15s. And at that point, you really got to look at it and, and judge which one is better. All right, so I guess we'll call that, you know, the first half of this. Well, how did we get to where we are with truck guns in the past of truck guns? The truck guns of the days of yore. And we'll get into the modern talk of what are today some of your best options. What are your best options right now for truck guns? All right. So excluding the ones we already talked about, which would still be fine choices. Right now, today. What's going to be your best option to up your firepower in the modern age? With modern threats, you know, active shooters that are a real thing. Radical Islamic terrorists that are a real thing. You know, being able to quickly dispatch a coyote. You know, any number of those things. Obviously situational dependent. You know, the guy that drives a Honda Civic from the suburbs to his urban cubicle is going to probably have different needs than the rancher that's driving around his ranch checking fences and mending fences. But still, we'll, we'll cover some good all-around choices here. And I think, you know, America's rifle, the AR-15, what it's become, and it's so customizable now that I think we got to talk about it as, you know, the number one choice for a truck gun nowadays. And you can pick other things, but just like I argue with a shotgun, start there. And then if you have a reason, like start with the shotgun for home defense. And if you can justify something else for you based on real world criteria, then that's fine. But I would start there with the shotgun for home defense. I would start with the AR for the truck gun. On the back seat of my Hummer, my driver's seat, I had carry a backpack. And Eberly stock. It's, I think, the Gun Runner. I forget the model, but it has a big scabbard in there where a long gun can go. Back behind my seat in there is an AR-15, quote-unquote, pistol with a pistol brace. And I kind of thought those were a gimmick for a long time. I was kind of against them, but I actually got one and ran it and shot it. And I think they're quite handy and quite practical. And it doesn't have to be an AR pistol, but they are kind of handy to keep behind, you know, the seat of your car. But I would say an AR-15 today. I would say start there. And you might have a different choice, but I run one in the city. I run one in the country. I ran one. It was my secondary rifle, depending on mission. But when I was the commander of an active shooter response team, my primary rifle was a SCAR-17. And the second most common rifle that I would carry would be that AR quote-unquote pistol. It was light, it was handy, it was a vast increase in firepower over my handgun. The gun that I carried on my hip all the time. It's a great truck gun. It's aluminum and polymer and nitride coated, which is a very impervious, very robust coating. It has backup irons, and it has a pretty robust red dot sight, so even if the red dot broke, I have backup irons. And I've got to say, as a professional guide and rancher and professional gunfighter, I've beat the crap out of that gun. I just took it to a youth class with a bunch of kids, you know, treating it like kids treat guns. And the thing's a rock-solid gun. It's dependable, it's accurate, it's reliable. So that's one of my, one of my, again, situational dependent, but one of my most common go-to truck guns. Again, it rides behind the seat of my Hummer, loaded with 55 grain 
Frontier Boat Tail Hollow Point Match Ammo. I use it in the country to take coyote. I use it in the city as an active shooter response tool. Now you don't have to get an air pistol, I, but I think consider the AR and whatever guys you want. If you just want a regular 16 inch M4 or M4 type rifle, you know, you can get those super cheap now. We kind of live in the golden age of ARs. You could build one of those. And I haven't built one since pre-COVID times, but you could build one of those pre-COVID times for 400 bucks, 500 bucks. Uh, I mean, I'm talking a good, reliable, reasonably accurate, dependable rifle. You could build a fine one. You could buy a fine one. You know, a Smith & Wesson M&P would be my first choice if you're buying one or a Delton or any number of those. You know, in a pistol configuration, an M4 carbine configuration... I kind of have a soft spot for the 20 inch barrel ARs because I, I mean, I went to war twice with them, but just a good dependable AR. They're so affordable. They're so within the reach of a common man nowadays. And they've been around and worked on so long and they're so customizable and there's so many companies making good parts for them. If you don't like the direct impingement system, you still have, you know, doubts about its reliability. There's a lot of companies that make really good piston ARs, and I like piston ARs. One of my, my go-to, I only own two ARs. I'm not a gun collector. I'm a gunfighter. You know, one of my go-to ARs is probably 15 years old at this point, and who knows how many rounds I've had through it, and it's a piston Adam's Arms, and that thing is still a tack driver. It's ridiculously accurate. It would be ridiculously accurate for a bolt gun. It's a nice, lightweight, pencil barrel, handy carbine that's ridiculously accurate. That's why it's not a truck gun. Because I kind of appreciate it so much, I don't want to beat it up. But that's kind of an aside. NAR is where I would start and look at that. The next one I would go to would be a pistol caliber carbine. And a big reason for this is, you know... Let's say, you know, you're slumming it that day and carrying a Glock. I'm just kidding. I got nothing against Glocks. But let's say you carry a Glock day to day. You can carry a couple of 30 round mags in a little pack and a pistol caliber carbine. Whether that's, you know, a kel Sub 2K or a super high end Gucci tricked out AR converted to 9mm with a good optic on it. That is still, even though it's a pistol caliber, I would consider it a big step up in firepower and shootability it takes a lot of dedication and practice to hit targets with a handgun reliably at 50 75 100 yards you can do it if you practice but you know i could take a 12 year old girl out and in a day fairly confidently have them hitting targets at 100 yards with a pistol caliber carbine so i'd say it is a step up and you're going to gain more velocity more shootability and Generally speaking, more capacity in a pistol caliber carbine. So I'd say look at those. We did a whole show on pistol caliber carbines. If you're interested in that, if you're like, yeah, pistol caliber carbine, that's, you know, that's calling to me. I want that. I want one that fits in a briefcase, fits in a laptop bag. You know, I'm more into the James Bond kind of stuff. Then, you know, maybe a Roni conversion is for you. But go back and listen to that episode. It's very recent on Gunfighter Life about pistol caliber carbines. Did a whole episode on them. But I'd say that'd be the next one to go to. You know, you don't want a little MP5, you know, beside the front seat of your car or in that back little compartment, that pocket that most cars have. You want an MP5 back there. You want a Roni conversion with a 30 round mag. I'd say rock on. That's a great choice. So pistol caliber carbine, next choice. And the next choice I would have you know that I love the shotgun if you listen for any amount of time. It's the, the weapon I practice with the least. It's probably the least cool gun, but it is the most practical gun. For in, in range, close up combat, the shotgun is unrivaled in its lethality. Yes, you're going to give up some range and some capacity, but its close range capabilities are unrivaled. If you're in an urban environment, or if you're only going to have one long gun in your car, then you want to be able to handle any contingency. You heard my background, and I've said this before. 
And I didn't come up with this. I got it from a very old episode of the Survival Podcast. But I can count the number of gunfights I've been in on both hands and have fingers left over. And you've heard my, my bio. Been to war twice for this country. Served on some of the nastiest streets in LAPD. Served as the commander of an active shooter response team. Still, I could count all the number of gunfights I've been in and have fingers left over. I can't recall the amount of times in my life I've had to eat. Putting food on the table, the shotgun is unrivaled. The shotgun will take anything from a dove or a chipmunk to a brown bear in Alaska. In fact, it is a go-to brown bear gun in Alaska, 12-gauge with slugs. And you talk about giving up range, but... If you get a good accurate shotgun, and I'm not even talking about a specialty slug gun. I'm talking about a good smooth bore all around shotgun with slugs that it's that it likes. You're talking a 150 yard gun. And you got to ask yourself, if you're talking about an all around gun in a defensive scenario, 150 yards is probably going to handle just about everything. Unless, you know, your primary thing you have a truck gun for is dispatching coyotes, which sometimes can have a pretty far shot. But if you're talking about a good all-around gun, a shotgun is a fine truck gun. You know, a Maverick 88 you can get for 200 bucks, or a nice Mossberg 590 or a Remington 870 with an assortment of birdshot and, and uh, keep it loaded with number four double-op buck and some slugs on the side saddle. That's a formidable weapon. It's what a lot of cops have in the center of their car you know, that's their truck gun you know when i was a cop riding around the streets of la what was beside me remington 870 with buckshot and slugs there's plenty of times as a cop i had access to ar-15s even in full auto or mini 14 or a shotgun and i grabbed the shotgun because it was the best tool for the job and i would say they're a fine choice for a truck gun my favorite all-around shotgun is no secret if you've listened for some amount of time. It's a Benelli M2. I really like that gun. But a good reliable semi-auto shotgun or a good reliable even cheap pump shotgun would be a fine choice. And it's a fine all-around weapon. And that doesn't change when you throw it in the back of your trunk of your car or behind the seat of your truck. Now, I probably should have thrown this in right after the AR. But the AK. You know, AKs are built like a tank. They're a hard-use piece of military machinery. Now, we've had a lot of different AKs come into the market in the past several decades. Some of them are awesome war machines, and some of them are cheap pieces of junk. But just because it looks like an AK doesn't mean it's going to be a good, reliable gun for you and doesn't mean it's going to be a good truck gun. But if you get a good, reliable AK, they... M would rival the AR neck and neck for a truck gun. They are the most prolific small arm in warfare around the world. And they would serve well as a truck gun. Again, with the caveat that you actually get like a military spec reliable, good trunnions, good receiver, you know, Russian, Polish, a good made AK. I gotta be honest, I like that round better for most things than I like the 223, the 762 by 39 is a fantastic, fantastic gun. The AK is a fine weapon with the caveat, if you're talking mostly about urban warfare, urban combat, you kind of give up a little bit as far as hunting. The round is fine for it, but the rifle doesn't lend itself well to it. And here's the big drawback for that that I see, and I really like the AK. In fact, I had a really nice Galil that I got rid of when I, well, let's just say I got rid of it. And I didn't want an AK for me or my guys when we were doing the active shooter response team. Because what's kind of the quintessential bad guy gun that you think of? It's the AK. And that's kind of ridiculous, but you can't argue with it as a reality. And if you are in an active shooter scenario and you pull out an AK, there's a high likelihood people are going to mistake you for the active shooter. That could happen with the NAR or anything else. But I think there is... In reality, a bias against the AK in America. I don't think that's right, and I don't agree with it. But it 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 is, and not liking it's not going to change it. That being said, and with that caveat, I would put it just behind the AR 
but a fantastic choice and a fantastic weapon. I rocked one in Iraq. I liked it. I had a catastrophic failure with my M16 in Iraq. I never had a single problem with an AK in Iraq. They're a fantastic weapon, a prolific war machine, and they'd serve fine as a truck gun. So I think this is a good one for your guys' feedback. Again, goodshepherdtraining.com. But let me know your truck guns. Let me know if you want me to share that on the air on a future episode. But what are you carrying behind the seat of your car in the trunk of your Honda Civic in your laptop bag? Let the audience know. You know, we're a tribe here. We're a community. Let's help each other out. What do you think is the quintessential or best truck gun? Again, that's goodshepherdtraining.com. One stop shop for more. Again, share share what you're carrying in the truck. Or again, uh, leave a comment. Comment on the podcast. You know, we're, usually you can scroll down, and leave some stars, and it has a thing for a comment. Say, "Great episode. My favorite truck gun is X." And then you know, people that listen on Spreaker, or iTunes, or Google, they can all see what your truck gun is, and you can use an anonymous name or whatever. You know, don't put out your plate number. But hey, you know, I like to rock a. Mossberg 500 with slugs. Or, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, a Ruger 1022 with a drum mag is the ultimate truck gun. What do you say? Whatever you want. Anyway, with that, guys, I hope you enjoyed this kind of fun chat. There's a lot of not fun stuff going on in the world right now, but I hope you enjoyed this thought experiment into the truck gun. We live in a far different world than we used to. And if cowboys could see the value of, you know, Let's call it a truck gun before they were trucks. Surely today we can see the value of a truck gun. So man up. All those cool guns in your safe aren't going to do you any good if you get in trouble and you need them. A gun on your hip and a gun close by. Some upgraded firepower in your vehicle. Alright guys, I'm going to throw in a tactical tip. You're probably waiting for something super awesome tactical about truck guns. But I'm not going to give you that. Tactical tip of the day for us men. Safety razors. We talked in the beginning about nostalgia. Sometimes the old ways are better. And I think that safety razors are awesome. I switched to them several years ago. Even my wife switched to them now. But it's just the old school razor you think about in World War One or World War Two. It's just a straight razor blade that you screw into a handle. Anyway, one single sharp razor blade screwed into a reusable handle. The Mach 3, the Mach 4, the Mark 12, whatever crazy amount of shark tooth blades you think you need, you really only need one sharp blade. Unless you just hate money, but I just looked it up on eBay. There's 100 Gillette Platinum double-edge razor blades for $12.99. And little tip on those, the safety razor blades, you can use the one side and then flip the blade over so you actually get like four cutting surfaces on them. You only need one at a time, but they last quite a while. Again, the safety razor blades, kind of the quintessential, you know, World War I, World War II, American man shaving system. You don't need some kind of fancy new space age razor. You need one sharp blade to cut hair. So that's tactical tip of the day. Old school safety razor. Which brings us to the tactical verse of the day. Remember to keep God first, because it doesn't matter how many gunfights you win or lose. doesn't mean anything if you don't have eternal salvation. Why do we need truck guns and to be ready? Why is being ready important? Luke chapter 17. In that day, he who was on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Nobody knows what the future holds. Every time I've ever needed a gun, I've needed it right now. Stand ready. Be ready. Thanks, and have a blessed day.